I want to thank the RailsConf team for selecting my talk for the memorable postmortems track and putting this wonderful couch conference together in what we all know are very difficult circumstances. I can only imagine how much work went into the planning of the conference and then how much more was needed for the replanning. So a huge thanks to the Ruby Central team. You all are heroes and I, I'm very grateful. And I want to thank all of you out there for choosing to watch my talk. I hope all of you and your loved ones are in good health and safe. My name is Jesse Spivak. I'm a senior engineer at Ibotta. I'm also a recovering educator and a father of twins. You can follow me on Twitter at Planet Efficacy for the best combination of Rails, political outrage, and fish content on the internet. I use he, him pronouns. I want to call out that there's a reasonable degree of safety in me giving a talk about making mistakes in this year's RailsConf memorable postmortems track. I'm privileged to typically enjoy a presumption of competence. I don't have to worry about not being taken seriously after owning up to a mistake. And I also don't have to worry that my mistakes might reflect on others who share my race, gender, religion, and other markers of identity. So the goal of this presentation is for me to talk about four major mistakes I made on the project I worked on this year. I'm gonna be honest and vulnerable so that you can avoid these missteps. Best case scenario, you walk away from this talk with a few ideas about how to not get paged six times at three in the morning. The four major mistakes I wanna tell you about are picking the wrong technology, siloing work between members of a team, premature optimizations, and making too many changes to a system at once. All of these mistakes stemmed from good intentions, but in the end, they came close to dooming the project altogether. I made these mistakes in the context of a project I worked on over the course of about six months at Ibotta, a cashback for shopping app with millions of users built in Denver, Colorado. Over the past six years, Ibotta has awarded over $682 million to its users, which we call savers. There have been over 178 million offers redeemed on our platform since RailsConf last year. And currently we have about 145 developers. We have a majestic Rails monolith on Rails 5.1, soon to be 5.2, God help me. And over the last two years, we've been moving to a service architecture composed mostly of Java, Kotlin, and Node microservices. I have feelings, but they are beyond the scope of this talk. So suffice it to say that uh, given the scale and complexity of what we do, I'm incredibly proud to be a member of the Abata team. The project I began around this time, a little over a year ago, was to take one aspect of the financial domain of our Rails app and move it into a microservice. For some additional context about the project, I wanna pause for a second to give an overview of the system we we're talking about. Brands pay Ibotta to run coupons or offers in our iPhone and Android apps, which pay cash to our users in return for the purchases they make. I work in the domain that tries to make smart predictions about when we should remove offers from the app so that we don't exceed budgets set in the contracts with our brand clients. A year ago, we had a system in place called Real-Time Expiration Service with two main purposes. First, Real-Time Expiration Service tracked budget usage for all content in our application using Redis. Second, by a scheduled job, all pertinent data was read from Redis and enriched with additional business information stored in our database. Information like which offers belong to which contracts. The job then iterated over each contract, calculated an expected date of budget exhaustion, and adjusted expiration dates on our coupons accordingly. We decided to move the new system, which we dubbed Real-Time Expiration Service version two, out of the Majestic Monolith to improve performance and decrease coupling such that we could add functionality more flexibly in the future. In particular, we were interested in iterating on smarter and more complicated prediction algorithms. Additionally, the system had a costly dependency we were hoping to remove from the monolith entirely, thereby decreasing our monthly AWS bill. So now the story begins. We had a great opportunity to make an impact on Ibotta's bottom line. 
We wanted to staff up the team in order to accelerate development. So we hired a new engineer with a background in tracking high volume ad events. We were really excited to get her involved in the project as soon as possible. When we began to scope out the project with our team, we naturally began to discuss which technology we thought might be the best fit for the problem space. Our new coworker was ardent that this was a perfect use case for Scala, her favorite language, and Akka, a framework for building concurrent distributed systems. I remember sitting in the planning meeting with my team, our manager and members of the architecture team, who we needed to get buy-in from about introducing new technology in this critical system. One of the most senior architects asked a ton of tough questions and our new teammate did not shy away from her conviction. The message I walked away with was you're making your bed and you're gonna have to lay in it. We could use Akka, but we have to accept responsibility for this decision and we would not have the benefit of any significant institutional knowledge or experience. Here's where the first best intention was not enough to ensure a perfectly executed project. The team had the good intention of picking the right technology for the problem. We saw a problem space that we thought our newest teammates' favorite tech could help solve. As a team, we tried to compromise with the larger engineering organization by splitting the difference on language and framework. We went with Kotlin, which is a JVM language, and there were already several services in production written in it, not to mention our entire, our entire Android app. We also went with Akka. Now, this was not a mistake because of some fun, fundamental flaw in Kotlin and Akka. I actually really like Kotlin and I kind of understand Akka. This was not a mistake because these technologies were not suited for our problem. I've seen many discussion threads arguing that technology X is better than technology Y. And after considerable back and forth, someone new chimes in that both technologies are perfectly adequate and the original poster should just pick the one she likes the best. So I'll say it again, I'm not hating on Akka or Colin here. Picking these technologies was a mistake because no one on the team had ever written any production grade Kotlin and only one of us in the entire company had any experience with Akka. The technology was a bad fit for our company and our team. It's fine to use new technologies for a proof of concept, a feature bake-off, or even a system of secondary importance. But our system, if we got it wrong, could cost millions of dollars. We picked the wrong technology and as a result, we had to fight a bunch of plumbing battles that slowed our progress. In retrospect, we should have used a more conventional stack for our company, such as Java, Spring, and Camel. Or if I could really have my way, Ruby and Rails, or maybe Sinatra. Sometimes it makes sense to take a gamble with a new technology and expand the team's skill set. I've heard the advice that software developers should pick up a new language every year. But this project was just too important and selecting tools that did not fit the team led to the next mistake. In my experience, teams of developers are at their best when they swarm on a common problem within a domain. In those cases, work moves quickly and knowledge is shared across the team effortlessly. As you may have already guessed, this was not the case on real-time expiration service version two. My second mistake was siloing work. While none of us were expert in Kotlin at the start, my teammate was very experienced with Akka. I had a lot of experience in our Rails monolith, and this was not the only project we were focused on at this time last year. Ibotta tends to move fast and has multiple priorities. So to get real-time expiration service version two delivered, we siloed work. My teammate took most of the Akka and Kotlin stories, and I handled the integration with the Rails monolith. Our intentions were to deliver the project faster than expected. And to do that, we siloed work. This was a big mistake. While in the short term, it accelerated our development. Over the life of the project and beyond, not having a shared, deep understanding of both systems actually slowed us down significantly. When it came time for me to modify code written by my teammate, I was completely lost. And we missed the opportunity for me to share my domain knowledge of our finance system. This went from manageable risk at the beginning to serious problem a few months into the project when my teammate joined a different team. And this is the real issue with siloed knowledge. Teams change, people move to new jobs. In my case, luckily my teammate just moved to a new area in the office, 
but any system that is dependent on the knowledge of one software developer is prone to failure. In retrospect, the right move would have been to slow down and pair on work until we felt comfortable in the other's domain. Then we could have moved much faster over the full project lifespan. And knowing now that my teammate was going to switch teams, not getting fluent in both systems was just obviously the wrong call. While we were siloing work, we were also making the additional mistake of prematurely optimizing various components in our system. Premature optimization can be an easy trap to fall into. It feels great to think about the most efficient way to process some data or imagine the system at 10 or 100 times anticipated scale. But in The Pragmatic Programmer by Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas, they say that you should work on optimizing a piece of code only when you know it is a bottleneck. Unfortunately, I read The Pragmatic Programmer six months into this project, which meant that I had basically undertaken six months worth of premature optimization before I could benefit from Andy and Dave's wisdom. We began to prematurely optimize on both ends of our system. We were thinking multiple steps ahead of where we actually were or needed to be. On the Rails side, I was hoping to preempt any unnecessary database trips. I had come across this issue in the past, so I thought by implementing some simple caching, I'd ensure that our database would not get hit too hard when we turn the service on. Oh, how little I knew. By implementing caching before we actually needed it, I made it really hard to debug some of the issues we encountered when we began to slowly roll out the system. This is especially frustrating because at the start, we turned the system on for only a single set of offers under one contract. At that level of traffic, there would be absolutely zero threat to the database. So no problem for my treasured caching to solve. So while we were running with a thousandth of the traffic we were building for, and the cache was not at all helping our database, it was actually making it horribly painful to debug the initial problems. On the Akka end, we were building a system that out of the box could process about 10,000 times more volume than we needed. My team jokes now that we built an F1 race car when we really needed a wheelbarrow. We also were building for the distant future instead of delivering incremental value. We started asking what ifs about the future features that we'd like to add and started building them before we had a strong foundation. For example, we anticipated eventually turning over the prediction algorithm logic to our analytics team by way of an Amazon Lambda function or machine learning call instead of solving that problem when we knew more or had uh, our service actually running and giving us feedback, we started to build out the data that these anticipated models might need right away. Again, our intentions were in the right place. We were trying to imagine the future where volume, performance, and complexity were far higher than the immediate short-term and medium-term needs. While premature optimization can be a fun engineering challenge, and it certainly made me feel smart at times, it inevitably made me feel dumb when I realized that I had spent all that time and energy solving an imaginary problem. And when trying to solve those imaginary problems, I ended up creating a lot of additional complexity, which turned into a very real problem. In hindsight, imaginary problems are not problems. I have learned to try to adopt a mindset of solving immediate problems. And I've become fond of the saying, that sounds like a problem for future us when I catch myself falling off track. We picked the wrong technology for our team and organization. We siloed work and we prematurely optimized. On top of that, we made probably our biggest mistake. We introduced too many changes at one time. In some ways, this dovetails with premature optimization. Real-time expiration service version two relied on both new input data and new processing. We had it running in various dry mode states where we could compare the results of V1 and V2. The problem was that we changed both input data and our algorithm for processing the data at the same time. As a result, when comparing the two systems, we were really doing an apples to oranges comparison. This is something that I think comes up when moving a piece of a monolith into a microservice. How do you know the microservice is working as expected if it is actually not meant to exactly replicate the functionality it's replacing. 
Our intention here was to have a more reliable and trusted data source, as well as more accurate processing. But we ended up having a tough time building confidence in our system because multiple pieces were changing simultaneously. One thing I've noticed when working with really experienced engineers, for example, Justin Hart, who was one of the first engineers at Ibotta, is that they make really bite-sized changes to the systems they work on. Then they verify those changes have the intended and expected results. Only after verification do they move on to the next change. There are no assumptions, no shortcuts. But in the end, slow and steady wins the race. Instead of making changes to what data stream we used as our source and how we process the data, we should have replicated the smallest possible unit of value for the business and iterated. We should have started with the input data and verified it against the old data. We then should have switched the old service onto the new data and verified. Only after being confident in the source data should we then have moved on to the prediction algorithm loop. I made four big mistakes. So, how does the story end? I love the idea of a memorable post-mortem track at RailsConf. Failure is feedback. Failure is an amazing teacher. I learned so much over the course of this project and I'm a much better developer for having gone through this experience of making these four big mistakes. But my story does not end with a traditional post-mortem meeting or document. Although I've done that many, many times. You see, even though I made these four big mistakes, there were some things that we did get right that enabled us to deliver the project and affect an estimated $1.5 million in annualized operational expense savings this year alone. We communicated our progress to our stakeholders. We presented our work with varying levels of technical specificity to various internal audiences. On top of that, we didn't wait until delivering the project to have our postmortem or retrospective. We discussed as a team the mistakes that were made and worked to mitigate them. I took Kotlin courses online. I started a baby's first Kotlin study group on our engineering team. I pulled in an engineer who'd been deep in Kotlin for the past year to do a code review with me on a feature I was working on. I ripped out my ridiculous cash. We stopped planning for the distant future and coming up with imaginary problems and started to focus on the immediate goal of 100% traffic moved from the monolith to the microservice. And somehow we did it. And that's why I felt it was important to give this talk. I was eager to share my mistakes, picking the wrong technology, siloing work, premature optimization, and making too many changes at once with my RailsConf brothers and sisters so that hopefully I can help you avoid making them yourself. I feel really fortunate to be a part of an incredible engineering team at Ibotta and to have come into coding as a career changer by way of the Turing School of Software and Design in Denver, Colorado. I'm grateful for this Rails community, and I want to thank all of you out there for watching my talk. If you have questions, feel free to reach out, stay safe, and I appreciate your time. Thank you.